with information on the latest developments in assistive technology, from the studios of 2RPH in Sydney, RPH Australia brings you AbleQuest. I'm Nikki Linderman and today we explore a medical tool which may be a surprise to some listeners. The use of botulinum toxin type A, or Botox as it is commonly branded, has received huge attention in recent years as a cosmetic tool for anti-aging used widely by millions of women and men in more affluent societies. However, few realise that this refined form of the deadly poison botulinum was originally developed to treat patients with debilitating neurological diseases such as dystonia. In these conditions, muscle spasms cause part of the body to lock up in painful positions. Injections of Botox chemically relax the muscles, liberating patients to function more independently and perform everyday tasks easily, such as eating and bathing. Since then, neurologists have explored using Botox for a whole host of other conditions, such as disability caused by strokes. In December 2012, Neuroscience Research Australia, or NEURA, released a paper regarding the use of Botox to assist in the longer-term recovery of stroke patients. To find out more, Barbara Sullivan spoke to Dr William Hun, research neurologist at NEURA. She asked Dr Hun, William as he preferred to be called, to tell us about the specific purpose of the research and what they found. I might just start by uh, giving a bit of background. So the, the study that I did on Botox, it's part of a broader research interest that I've been in, undertaking for the past three to four years. And that focuses on the relationship between stroke and brain activity changes and then how these impact on the recovery of stroke patients. So as we might know um, or not know, mm. stroke is a leading cause of disability worldwide and spasticity uh, is a potential con- consequence of the stroke. And how many people suffer from spasticity? It's uh, actually a very hard uh, thing to answer. Uh, literature sort of has a very, very broad range. You, you hear things from between about 5 to about more than 50%. Right. So it's extremely uh, difficult. It's not that uh, common, and I don't think there's actually uh, good studies to actually look at the uh, incidence. Yeah, so this is going back to... Um, to actual spasticity, so it actually does contribute to or even worsen disability. And then just to give a quick uh, description of what it is, spasticity itself, just in case uh, for those that don't know, it's the stiffness and also the restricted movement around a joint. And that's usually due to an overactive muscles that can occur after stroke. And so for, for many years now, as you know, we've been using Botox to treat spasticity in stroke patients. And that's assuming that much of its effects come from its action by paralyzing the injected muscle. So the purpose of this study is really twofold. The first is to determine whether there are any abnormal brain wave activity that may be accounting for the development of this spasticity. And right. secondly, whether injecting Botox into the affected arm or leg muscle or both in patients with spasticity can be associated with any alterations in this brain activity. And what's interesting about our findings is that our study showed stroke patients with spasticity had abnormal brain activity and that after we inject them with Botox, not only do we see the expected improvement in muscle stiffness, but there's also a change in the pattern of brain activity as well. So, so why does the effect of Botox on the brain arise? Mm, well, according to our study, it's suggested that maybe the effects of Botox on the brain can arise either because the toxin travels directly to the brain, and certainly some experimental models using rats have uh, shown this, or because the injected muscles are sending different signals back to the brain, and in that way, changing the way patterns of electrical activity are processed and generated in the area of the brain that governs movement, and that's the area we refer to as the uh, metacortex. But either way, I think what we found is that Botox treatment in the affected muscle not only improves the muscle disorder in stroke patients, but it also helps restore the normal activity in the brain. And that's just on the side of the brain where there is, uh, that's been affected by the stroke? No, actually, interestingly not. Uh, the, the specific uh, recruitment process of the study uh, required that these patients have um, I suppose, let me rephrase this, um, patients with uh, quite significant spasticity after stroke usually have um, a very elevated threshold in the affected 
uh, side of the brain, so much so that it makes it actually hard to uh, record or actually um, observe electrical activity. So uh, these patients usually have some sort of abnormal compensatory response on the what we call the unaffected or the side of the brain that's actually not mm. affected by the stroke itself. So what my study has actually looked at is actually looked at on the other side, the actually uh, in inverted commas, the unaffected side of the brain, and seeing how those changes are related to stroke recovery and spasticity. So what we see in this study actually specifically looks at the unaffected side, if you want to put it that way. And so this is this is groundbreaking research. This is basically it's it's been sort of suggested in other disorders uh, of muscle activity, but this is the first in terms of uh, looking at Botox in stroke patients with spasticity. Yes. Well, I understand from what you've said that Botox has been used clinically for the past few years to yes. treat stroke patients. And so, will your findings impact the way it's been administered? Mm. I mean, I think the findings in this study would not really change the way we um, administer Botox to these stroke patients with spasticity. But what these results have provided um, us with is a better understanding of brain activity and also its relation to stroke recovery. And hopefully through this improved knowledge, we'd be able to um, develop ways to improve outcomes and complications of stroke survivors. Right. So harnessing the plasticity of the brain is a common approach Mm -hmm. in stroke rehabilitation. Um, Does Botox treatment work hand in hand with occupational therapy and the various exercises? Yeah, so um, I suppose I'll address the first concept. Brain plasticity is actually quite a topical and exciting area in neurology, Mm. particularly with respect to stroke and its rehabilitation. So not only are we actually improving our understanding of this natural plastic process that's going on in the brain after a stroke or any other insult to the brain, but more and more research is actually going into using specific techniques to manipulate this brain plasticity to uh, improve stroke outcomes and recovery. Mm. But like the management of stroke itself, physical therapy, uh, and that's going to encompass a holistic approach with the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, and other allied health uh, professionals Mm. is definitely required in conjunction with medication, and that includes Botox injections when we are aiming to achieve a satisfactory result for spasticity. And in fact, um, Botox injection is actually not recommended unless patients either have tried and failed physical therapy or are currently also receiving such treatment. Does the Botox need to be administered fairly soon after they have a stroke? The current sort of guidelines, it's not that uh, well defined. And again, it depends on when the actual spasticity develops. And again, that's a, actually a very hard question to answer. You've, had, you've got patients... Uh, sort of having suggestions or signs of spasticity developing, you know, like within weeks or months after a stroke, yet you have other patients uh, getting the spasticity much longer down the track, like a year or so. Right. So, but then the guidelines actually say that we should, should not give Botox at least three months after the stroke. And there's a few reasons why we do that. One is because giving the Botox itself it, it's a par- paralytic, sort of, it paralyzes the muscle. Right. So we actually don't want an initial phase when the patient is trying to regain some function or strength to actually make that muscle weaker. Mm. And the other reason is uh, in the first three or six months, there's probably some, some level of um, an intrinsic activity in the brain that's trying to recover it or restore itself. So we don't really want to you know, give uh, medication to mu- that might interfere with this process. Most of the um, recovery should have happened uh, by about three months or so. Are there any adverse effects to mm. administering Botox? I mean, since it impacts the cortex, is yep. it likely to affect memory or learning? Yeah. So I suppose just to answer the first bit of the question, the adverse effects, given, if given correctly and by an experienced physician, not much really can go wrong. The only possible uh, issues are if too much is given or, um, or given inappropriately, then we can get excessive weakening of the actual injected muscle or neighbouring muscles, because some of the uh, Botox can actually pass on to uh, neighbouring muscles. But then if that happens, the effects are quite short-term and wears off after about three months or so. And that's why patients usually require uh, repeated administrations every uh, 12 to 16 weeks, depending on response. Um, Answering your second part of the question, whether it impacts uh, other uh, um, functions like memory or learning, well, the study... Uh, that we performed really looked at the effects and changes in the cortex that governs that muscle movement, that sort of motor cortex we talk about. Mm. And these patients we saw or studied already had an abnormal brain activity in this area to begin with from the stroke and also probably because of this they had spasticity develop. And what Botox did was it brought this level of activity uh, in the area back to normal. 
So I'd, I'd probably say it is not likely to have an effect on other areas of the cortex, uh, for example, those uh, uh, governing memory or learning. But obviously, to be able to give you a more definite um, answer to that question, we'd need to have studies to specifically look at memory and learning as one of the uh, outcome measures. So is that a possibility for you to research that area? And yeah, for what sure. A- I mean, yeah, there's a lot of parameters we can actually incorporate into any research study. I suppose the things we need to, from the beginning, uh, have a hypothesis, what we're looking at first. And I suppose in the beginning, we, we didn't have you know these other cognitive um, function as one of the outcome measures that wasn't specifically addressed. So if that's something that we might be interested in, that can definitely be incorporated to future studies, yes. And uh, what are the next steps in your research? Have you got uh, these um, planned out? For- sure. So, um, so obviously these are pretty exciting initial results. And um, what we can think about next really is whether giving Botox to those stroke survivors with the highest risk of developing spasticity, and these are usually patients with the highest um, um, level of disability or the biggest of strokes, whether these patients can um, be given early and prevent or at least reduce the extent of the disabling complication. Mm. And secondly, in addition, um, we now that we recognise the pattern of brain activity that's associated with this spasticity, as well as the pattern associated with improvement after Botox, we may be able to use this information to develop other strategies. For example, there are brain stimulation techniques that can actually alter the uh, the pattern of brain activity and see whether this can actually treat spasticity. Uh, for example, um, recent research or increasing research now in stroke and rehab is using a technique of brain stimulation with a magnetic impulse called repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. And what we're trying to do there is basically... Uh, um, uh, change the level of brain activity in both sides of the brain, the affected and unaffected, with a view to improving the actual uh, uh, level of function in these stroke mm-hmm. patients. So maybe we can apply something similar technique in terms of uh, um, improving or actually uh, preventing the occurrence of these complications like spasticity. So how do you recruit people to take part in your research? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a process that requires um, ethical... Um, uh, approval. So what we normally do is we write uh, a written sort of application through the local area health service ethics committee, and they uh, and basically we state our aims, the protocols of the um, the research study, and all things involved, which which would be things like uh, what we're looking at, the the outcome measures, the possible side effects or risks to the patient, and then they have to. Uh, um, to have a board meeting and determine whether you know, your, your project is feasible and whether it's deemed safe for the patient. And then what happens then, with our work in affiliation with uh, Prince of Wales Hospital, mm. we, uh, I, well, as myself, I go to the stroke unit as well as the rehabilitation unit and try to find appropriate candidates that fit our selection criteria for the study. Thank you very much for that uh, detailed discussion about your research, William. And uh, we certainly look forward to hearing about the next stage and I'll be checking in with you. That was Dr William Hun, research neurologist at Neura in Sydney, speaking with Barbara Sullivan. Their website is www.neura.edu.au. In the next edition of AbleQuest, we stay on the subject of Botox and explore its use in cerebral palsy therapy. You have just been listening to AbleQuest, a program that looks at developments in assistive technology. I'm Nikki Linderman. Thank you for listening and goodbye till next time.